I look out at this great audience today and immediately think, this is everything I want to avoid as a professor. <laughs> because I know that in a few minutes, you could all look like this. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tom Neufer, and I'm an assistant professor of the practice in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at Duke. I've been teaching in our undergraduate neuroscience major for the last seven years. Well, we wanted to thank the organizers for inviting us to present, and we are really grateful for this opportunity to share our research. I'm Ben Thier, and I'd be lying if I told you that I've never looked like a student in that photo before. I'm a senior here at Duke studying neuroscience and education. My interest lies in the intersection of those two fields, learning science. It really started because I came to Duke wanting to learn more about how my own brain worked. I figured if I could just get tips and tricks from the field of learning science, then surely all that difficult coursework to come, especially in this guy's class, would be a whole lot easier. Now, four years later, I have that same goal, but on a much wider, more important scale, equipping our educators and students with the tools they need to improve the learning experience. Our mission, in the short time we have with you today, is to convince you why education needs to move away from that sleepy, familiar lecture hall and towards something far better, and yes, perhaps more daunting and unfamiliar. This is what we think it should look like. Students working together, talking, actively applying what they know to novel situations. But the question is, how do we get here? Data. That's right. Education has typically been a stagnant field, full of resistance because, understandably, it can be pretty scary for teachers to change up the way they've been used to teaching for so long. But education is gradually becoming transformed as it intersects with cognitive psychology, research, and assessment. On both sides, Dr. Neufres professor and me as student, we are passionate about using that data to help transform the learning experience. As an educator, I noticed this shift and began to engage in the process of self-assessment to critically think about my teaching methods and how to help my students learn. Now, before I show you our data, I would like to take a step back and talk about how I became an educator and why I'm so passionate about the use of evidence-based teaching practices. I came to Duke in 2006 as a postdoc in the Department of Neurobiology. Our lab was studying the cellular and molecular mechanisms responsible for memory formation. So basically, that meant I spent a lot of time sitting in a microscope looking at these neurons and really trying to figure out the strength of the connections between those cells. Well, I really enjoyed this discovery aspect of my job and taking beautiful pictures like this, but really, it was the science communication part of my job that I loved the most. And at a certain point, I knew I wanted to enter into teaching and undergraduate education. All right, well, now I decided I wanted to be a teacher and with very little training, enter into the classroom. And I started using teaching methods that were familiar to me, right? Basically, the traditional lecture. However, as the years went by, I really began to question whether my teaching methods were that effective. I would look out into these large lecture halls and see a lot of empty seats, distracted students, and even worse, sleeping students. At a certain point, I started to wonder, is there a better way? Like, how can I actually help, or how can I reach my students? Well, through some really inspiring workshops offered by Duke Learning Innovation and a number of great faculty mentors, I began to shift my approach toward active learning. What is active learning? According to Freeman and colleagues at the University of Washington, active learning engages students in the process of learning through in-class activities and discussion, as opposed to passively listening to an instructor and absorbing information. These higher order activities can take on many forms, from think pair shares to clicker use to gallery walks of student work. So basically the exact opposite of what we've been doing here today with you. One form of active learning is team-based learning, or TBL. In TBL, students uh, work together uh, in permanent teams throughout the semester, and they spend the majority of class time learning to apply and problem solve. This is in contrast to the standard lecture, where the majority of class time is actually spent on content transmission. Well, TBL was developed in the 1970s by Larry Michelson as a way to convert these large lecture halls into interactive, engaging spaces for students to learn. So three years ago, I decided to redesign my lecture courses and convert them into TBL. 
And I have to say, it has really transformed my classroom and made teaching and learning an enjoyable experience for both me and my students. All right, well, at this point, you're probably wondering, all right, does this work? What's the evidence? How might it work? Well, as it turns out, there's a growing body of literature showing that these active, team-based approaches to learning increase student learning and decrease failure rates. Importantly, the largest learning gains are seen for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. All right, well, how might this work? So it's thought that through the use of space practice, providing a lot of feedback, and creating an interdependent community of learners, we can actually achieve these learning gains. All right, well, I then wondered, what about our Duke students? Uh, does TBL help them to learn? And really, for TBL to go smoothly, you need a couple ingredients. Right? You need students that are passionate about learning. Uh, they need to be hardworking. And we're lucky here at Duke because that's what we have. But there is one additional thing that you need. And that is a willingness to participate and to speak up. All right, have you ever been to Cameron Indoor Stadium? Do our students have a problem participating? <laughs> no. So I think they're actually the perfect group to test the effectiveness of TBL. So I'm now going to show you data that I collected from my own classrooms. And what we're looking at here are end of semester course evaluations for a single course. However, the course was taught in two different formats. So for two semesters, I taught it in team-based learning. And then for two other semesters, I used non-TBL, a little more lecture-heavy version of the class. Well, when we compared the two versions of the course to each other, what we saw was that the course and instructor evaluation scores were pretty similar, suggesting that there was no overall difference in student satisfaction. However, when we began to look at the specific measures of gaining factual knowledge, understanding fundamental concepts, and synthesizing and integrating knowledge, then we saw a significant increase for the TBL taught versions of the semester. This work was done in collaboration with Dr. Minna Aang, and these results are in strong agreement with other literature showing the effectiveness of TBL. Dr. Neufer's course evaluations were the starting point. He saw some trends on a small scale. Students were reacting positively to these collaborative learning environments with high structure. With support from Bass Connections at Duke, Dr. Neufer and Dr. Ng wanted to take this type of self-assessment to the next level, up quite a few levels, actually, as this superstar team administered a survey to nearly every STEM class at Duke. We wanted to see how course structure affected various behaviors and attitudes related to learning. We assessed for outcomes such as desire to stay in a STEM field, engagement within the classroom, motivation, and engagement. We coded these courses based on the amount of structure, specifically the percentage of class time that students were speaking. And we mean, when we say speaking, we don't mean you know, goofing around. We mean like using these active learning strategies that we've talked about. So for the low structure courses, this is really the equivalent of a traditional lecture class, where students are speaking less than 15% of class time. Then we have the moderate structure courses. This gets into that active learning territory where students are speaking anywhere from 15 to 40 percent of time. And then finally, we have the high structure courses, where students are speaking for greater than 40 percent of time. That would be typical in a TBL classroom. And really, we use the approach here outlined by Eddie and Hogan in 2014. Initial analysis of the results show some very exciting trends. These graphs show, the, show you the average student response grouped by structure. So one is for the students in low structured courses, two moderate, and three that highest level of structure. In addition, the stars on the graphs show you the significant differences between each of the groups. We found that students in higher structured courses reported a more welcoming and inclusive classroom environment, a lower sense of competition with their peers, and a greater degree of confidence in their knowledge of core content. Even more, we found that these students in higher structured courses reported higher levels of working together and greater levels of engagement throughout the duration of each class. We also borrowed questions directly from Duke's end of semester course evaluations. Once again, we found that these students in higher structured courses reported a higher ability to gain factual knowledge, apply and analyze knowledge, and synthesize knowledge more so than their peers in lower structured courses. These factors, confidence, engagement, sense of community, 
they all contribute to a positive and social classroom environment. The social learning experience is key. It can predict willingness to stay in STEM fields and reduce dropout rates from the pipeline that disproportionately affects underrepresented students. However, not everything was positive about the high structure courses. The students also reported feeling more stress and less instructor support. So there may be a learning curve to this. And we know that there are challenges associated with collaborative learning. For example, there could be concerns within the team about workload distribution. Not only that, interpersonal problems can develop. However, in approaches like TBL, we do take steps to ensure that students come to class prepared and do participate. So for example, on most class periods, they'll actually take a formative assessment at the start of class to help ensure that they've done the new learning. Furthermore, they complete peer evaluations of each other throughout the semester uh, to provide constructive feedback to each other about their performance. As you can imagine, developing a survey for every STEM class at Duke was no easy task, and we are grateful to all the professors who agreed to participate. In an ideal world, we would love to sit in on every class to observe the behaviors being reported in the data, but due to the scope of this research, that was nearly impossible. In the future, looking at more direct measures of learning can help strengthen the claims we've made here about specific outcomes. The guiding question in our research is to see how collaborative learning impacts the experiences for underrepresented students in all STEM fields. This will be the next stage of our analysis as we move toward, as we continue to identify best teaching practices to close achievement gaps and create inclusive, supportive environments for all students. We believe that by harnessing the power of classroom data, we can protect against STEM dropout for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. And this is why we are so committed to using data to help transform the learning experience. Engaging in a culture of self-assessment is crucial if we are going to meet the needs and embrace the challenges of all students regardless of background. Many students and educators are comfortable with the traditional lecture. I know I was for years. And you can imagine that at a place like Duke, maybe the teaching method we use doesn't even matter, right? With students that are so talented and highly motivated, maybe they're just going to learn the material, you know, no matter what we do. However, our data clearly indicate that structure matters, and that with higher structure courses, our, our group and others are seeing improvements in student learning and classroom dynamics. We can always strive to do better and set an example for our peers. Duke is world class for our research on topics big and small, from solving the most pressing medical problems to looking at the tiniest proteins under the microscope. We argue that research about ourselves should be added to that list. If Duke wants to stay on the forefront of innovation, that starts with supporting our students in the classroom. Our future doctors, MBA stars, authors, leaders, they're all right here ready to learn and apply what they know. No matter what steps are taken to engage in self-assessment, critical reflection is key so that future groups of students can see improvement. And perhaps most importantly, this shows our students that we care. By being up here together, we want to show that students and educators are equally committed to transforming the educational experience. It doesn't matter if you're a student, a faculty member, or administrator. Everyone can be involved in promoting evidence-based teaching practices. Our evidence showed that collaborative, team-based learning environments worked for our students and helped them thrive. This is significant because, whether we like it or not, we're going to be on teams for the rest of our lives. Whether in the office space, even online and in relationships, teamwork and collaboration is part of everything we do and everywhere we go. Working together in, an, in inclusive, diverse environments to innovate and solve problems is key not just in, in education, but for the world outside the four walls of our classrooms as well. Thank you.